So the Becker exam, the last chapter that I just kind of didn't look at, I'm like, nah, I'm never going to get tested on this. Like no one's going to test me on government accounting. It's impossible. Like government accounting is so boring. The guy will not, it will not see this on the exam. Yeah. Little did I know my simulation, all government accounting. And I'm like, this is the worst situation <laughs> ever. Okay, so I can Welcome to the Unknown Options, the place where we explore the unknown options, the number one source for career apprehension and accessibility. My name is Will, and today with me, Christopher. Christopher, it's great to have you here. Give us a run on who you are and what you do. Hey, Will, thanks for having me, man. Uh, yeah, I'm Christopher, uh, and my background is heavy in the accounting space. I'm a CPA, and a little bit about me, uh, I'm a very general securities person. The one quote I bring to anyone I talk to, I'm relentlessly optimistic. And people learn that after they get to know and work me and how I think about life. Um, so yeah, that's a that's a huge component of who I am. I have two little kiddos, uh, a, a new dad, if you will, under three. And so that's the pleasure of my life right now. And uh, I work in the startup space and, and currently based in Southern California. So that's a little, little bit about me. Love it. Thank you for joining us today, Christopher. Hoping you get a lot of sleep with the with the two kiddos. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Maybe it'll get there. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully so. Your journey is important, so we want to highlight the good, the bad, and the ugly. For someone who might not know, what is it like being an accounting professional with your CPA license? Yeah, so accounting is uh, me personally. I love the field. Like it's so complex, and I can go through a rabbit hole with what the industry is kind of changing with right now. But in the very simple terms, like what is the accounting profession? It is the record keeping and maintaining, uh, maintenance of, of a business. And so what that could be, it could be like a lot of different things. It could be like managing property. If, if someone sells like um, inventory, let's say you're selling books or selling like a lighting company, an accountant could basically be part of that team to track those goods. So that's like one of the process of it. And then the other part of it, I like to describe like a service. And so someone in accounting can help track that business's revenue or the, or the, the, or the items or services they provide. Like for example, uh, this is the big and currently state like the telehealth space. There's a lot of uh, companies that provide telehealth services. So Will, if you come to my company, and I provide services for you, you'll meet with a physician, you know, a coach or whatever, and then we'll give you the service. We, as an accountant, help that business manage those costs, report on them, et cetera. And so that's kind of like the gist of what the, someone in accounting does. And to go deeper, like a CPA, now what's a, a CPA? So CPA stands for Certified Public Accountant. And so basically you're like a super saiyan for like, <laughs> for for accounting, if you get your CPA license. And so uh, to get a CPA license, it's a very rigorous process. Uh, I got licensed back when I graduated in high school, uh, college in 20, uh, 2012, a year after I got my CPA exam under my belt. And then essentially you are opened up with a lot of opportunities. Like basically you can lead teams. You can, you, you understand how to problem solve. Uh, you need to get into really depth of different types of fields. Accounting is really broken out into a lot of different types of accounting. And so with the CPA license, you know a bit about every single aspect of it. And you you really, it's like a, it's like a statement of saying like you have a really solid uh, background in accounting, but let alone you also are capable of more. That's kind of, I would say, about a CPA license. Uh, but the legal term for use, like the legal use of a CPA license is basically being able to issue opinions, like an audit opinion. And so what that means is, uh, say, well, your business grows very high and like you want to get a loan from a bank. The bank says, um, okay, I'll give you $100,000, but I want your books to be audited. I want to make sure that your numbers, what you're reporting to me is real revenue and the expenses like are sound, like everything's good. If you have a CPA license like myself, I, you could hire me. I could audit your books and, and then issue a letter to the bank. And then the bank would say, yep, you got an official clean opinion on your books. Chris says they're good. Your, your financials are solid from the CPA. Solid. I'm going to give you this loan now. So there's a lot of complexity. That's a very simple example. There, that gets into other aspects of it. 
bonds, financing, debt covenants, there are all these complicated things, but that's how a general gist of what, what makes a CPA license legally that you can do a service like that. So I love it. I love it. How, how did Christopher get started in the accounting space and specifically to like, I guess, migrate into like the startup industry? Too? Yes, that's a great question. So uh, I actually didn't want to be an accountant at first. So when I went to college, um, I was actually studying to be an engineer. Okay. And so I love math. Like I, re I really like math in general. And it's like my language. Like I understand how it works. It's, it's friendly to me. It comes naturally to me. Yeah. And English is my second language. So growing up, I spoke Spanish primarily. Oh. And so I had to learn English. And my, my, I, actually, I actually found my report card like six months ago. And I saw I got like a, a D in one of my English classes in my sophomore year in high school. I'm like, whoa, what's going on? Nevertheless... My English is great now and it's not a problem. But anyways, I really like numbers. And so what I ended up doing is I got into engineering because I saw calculus and that it's kind of a natural like thought for me to go into. I got into calculus one and I was like, all right, this is cool. I, I like it. It's it's not crazy. Then I got into calculus two and I said, who the hell's doing this? This is insane. They got into all sorts of kind of complicated math. And I really enjoy, I love problem solving, but this was like crazy stuff to me. Like, I like, I don't know why I'm going to use this. Yeah. And so I eventually said, you know what, let me just take a business class. Like, let me just take another numbers business class. And I got introduced into a, like a business intro class. And then I also got into like intro to accounting, like one-on-one accounting, uh, basic accounting. And so I got into those two courses. The business accounting I really liked because I unknowingly then, I just really liked being a part of communicating with people. Like I'm way more of an extrovert in some ways because that's where I get my energy from, connecting with people. And so taking that class got me to see, all right, cool, these are kind of my people. Like I actually like talking about ideas, brainstorming. Not to say engineers don't, but really the, the engineer mindset was like, keep your head down, problem solve. And it was, it was, it was, it wasn't really more interactive per se. And so I'm like, okay, cool. This is kind of what I like. Then I got into accounting, uh, that basic class. And I was like, oh, debits and credits. Like, this is how businesses work. Like, oh, like this is how Walmart or Albertson at the time, whatever business was operating. Yeah. Like, oh, this is how they this is how someone would actually track an expense or like how people make money, like how an independent person can actually generate their own income. It was really fascinating to me that it was like a world that I didn't really understand before. And so that just kind of, that just kind of sucked me in. And so after that initial first year, I took like the basic accounting class and then my sophomore year, or I think it was my, my sophomore year that I switched. Um, I took an intermediate accounting class and that my teacher was like one of the best, if not in the country. He was so good. I went to a really small school uh, called Walla Walla University. Oh, it's in cool. uh, it's in Washington State. And so he really made me like love accounting. And like, uh, if not, I really I already loved it, but it really made me see how much I really enjoyed it. Sure. And and so from that point on, I was like, okay, this is what I'm doing. I love accounting. It makes sense. Awesome. It's really a good field. Uh, and number, like on top of that, like in my mind, thinking mathematically, I'm like, okay, the return on investment, my ROI. Okay. I can get my degree in four years. <laughs> I can make this much money after it's going to pay itself off in, you know, four or five years, whatever the math was at the time. Mm -hmm. I'm like, cool, this is good. I'm not going to be in school like a doctor for, for 10 years and not see return for a long time. And so, and I can start making money now. So that's kind of the thing that I thought about. And so that was kind of like my starting journey. I did not like engineering after getting into camp, like, man, I really like accounting and then went into this. And so, uh, yeah, that's how I got into accounting. Then how did I get into the startup space? That's a long journey. So, uh, I got into the startup space. I moved to New York, uh, without a job. My wife is a traveling OT and, uh, I just wanted to, I've always wanted to live in New York city. And so we moved there. And we didn't have an apartment. We basically booked one-way tickets. And I'm like, let's make it happen. And so we we got in an apartment uh, for four months. And I loved it so much. I'm like, let's just stay. And then we stayed. 
year after year, like, oh, let's say another year, let's say another year. And so at my time in New York, um, I used to work at an accounting firm called Ernst & Young EY. It's like a big four accounting firm. It's like the top four of the country. Yeah. So I, I used to work for them on the West Coast. And then I decided to take a break, do something something else. And then I came back. And then when I was in New York, I said, hey, I really like my profession. Let me see if I can go back into it. And then I was able to get on pretty quickly. Um, networking, that's big. Um, that's another story. But I was able to join UI in, in New York. And then I spent about five years at UI in New York City. And then from there, I got put on a couple startup audits. And that got me, that got me like, oh, hooked. I'm really? like, <laughs> like you can like we're auditing a, a startup and the books like needed some help like they were doing this they were doing that and i'm like whoa like okay how about you guys just do this and fix it or just do this and fix it and just do fix it and it was very helpful for them and so when that occurred to me i was like oh i have a very strong skill that for me at the time i thought was common sense like with you know tunnel vision not everyone should know how to do accounting which number one is obviously not true. Um, but number two, it's like, I have a very high, uh, good, valuable skill that other companies that are trying to build need, need some help. And so then at the time, uh, the startup reached out to me and I was like, ah, oh, should I really join? Uh, you know, it's a little bit risky because, you know, it's not established. They're, they, you know, they're barely, they just raise funds, things like that. Yeah. And then I had a couple of mentors at UI, which they're awesome. They're great partners uh, that I worked under. And one of them knows me very well. And she's like, you just got to do it. It's totally you. That's like who you are. Like you have to try. And so with some mentorship and some guidance, I said, you know what? Let me, let me, let me, let me bet on myself. And I said, let me go see if I can build a team in the company accounting department. And then that's when I joined that, that company, Calibrate Health. And so ever since then, man, I just loved it. Cause it's like, there's no, there's no like, there's no uh, menu or, or a manual to follow. You just have to know, okay, this is what's happening. Something's burning. You got, okay, people got to get paid. Let me make sure payroll works. And then, oh, we got to financials. You got to get organized and put together for investors. And it's, it's really chaotic. It's like, there's, there's no lineage to it whatsoever. Your job is to come in, get organized, make it efficient for the business so that it can improve its reporting and all these other aspects that come under the rule. And so that really enticed me and I really enjoyed my time there. And that's like the start of my startup experience. Do, do you think uh, like working at a big four firm prepared you for that? Or do you think like you, like your mind, like your mathematical mind was already aligned to like yeah. kind of, <laughs> of a startup? Yeah, uh, great question. I would say, I would say that big four prepares you for like being gritty and like being able to work on hard things so like i've i've worked with different types of people in different backgrounds like someone that comes from a big four background versus like a smaller tier accounting firm and it's no diss on anyone i'm not dissing anyone who starts a small firm or a higher firm i will just say that most often in my experience people that have worked at a big four have more of a grit kind of perspective that they can work through something harder and work on multitasking a lot better yeah. than someone that was at a smaller firm because they don't get to deal with a lot of challenges at one time, if that makes sense. Okay. There's, there's a lot of volume coming at you at a big four and you're doing a ton of stuff yeah. versus at a smaller firm, you may have one client and you're doing like one area versus at a big four, you'll have like three, four clients maybe, and then you're doing this area, this area, because we want to, we want to train you up so you can eventually lead. So that's my experience. So I would say big four did help me prepare for that. Do I need big four experience to work in a startup? No, definitely not. Like you do not need that. So you can definitely work at a smaller company. I would say more times than though, uh, if, if a startup company wants to go public or if they want to have an audit by a big four company, which typically requires someone that knows how big four audits happen and so there's a lot of processes that i know based on my background being at ui that i know exactly what they're looking for how they audit what they look at or how they would think to look at something even if i don't know it i kind of know the risks of what they're expecting in the business yeah. and so bringing that big four background really helped me kind of prepare you know for an audit and so that being said at calibrate health uh, i got them successfully through uh, the first year audit, 
which is pretty crazy. Um, they raised the Series B right when I joined. I think it was about $100 million right after I joined. So that's a good venture capital funding for a business. And so, and then within the next year, we had to do an audit. And so I had to do everything, like everything in accounting. And it was crazy. So, so yeah, it's like, okay, revenue. Okay. How do you recognize revenue? That's a whole, like, especially like there's people that are only hired to do revenue recognition and do policies to make sure revenue is reported. Right. So I did that component. There's like lease accounting and goodness. They didn't have lease accounting. Uh, <laughs> that's very complicated. There's financial reporting disclosures. I basically wrote up the full financials. There's equity. There's a lot of, uh, components, equity, like stock options, stock based comp. There's, um, uh, all sorts of things that come into accounting that are very complicated that I had to take under my belt, learn it and figure it out so that we can get through the audit. And so very successful in that aspect, but it did, it definitely helped me make that startup be more successful given that they have those requirements. It, it doesn't mean you need big more background. I, I think it'll just help you more so. And it really just depends on the startup that you're working for. Some startups are very big, some are very small. Maybe they don't have hundred million funding. Maybe it's like 10 million funding. They're starting small, 500K, things like that. So it, it just depends on the need of the business. So. I love it. It's almost like accountants, or you might have heard this before, but I guess almost like accountants are like un, the unseen heroes or the unspoken heroes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I like to say, I like to describe, and I I really like my team taking a lot of credit for the work that we do, but I would like to describe us the man behind the curtain mm. because we, without accounting, like, and this gets into cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, if you're into that, it gets, okay. I, love those, I love that evolution because that is like accounting ledger. But without, without the accounting profession, like you can't, businesses can't record well to investors, how they're growing. Like, how are you progressing? What are you spending money on? How much are you paying your people? Are you paying people a reasonable rate? Is everything tying? Like if you're a publicly traded company, Dallas financials, investors rely on. Like if your accounting is crap and you have errors, you're in, you're, you're in a big, you have a big problem. Uh, yeah. Recently, a really recent one, like a, two days ago, I think Lyft had their quarterly reporting. They're a publicly traded company, the car rent up, the car driving company. Yeah. The in their disclosure, they reported a 500 basis points like gross profit, but it was actually an error. It should have been 50 basis points. Oh wow! 500 basis points versus 50 basis points is a huge is a huge discrepancy. And so your accountant and your, your financing accounting team is responsible for those disclosures. And so it just shows to how critical like that team function is important for like the, the markets to rely on. So anyways, that, that's kind of a, a, a real example. It really just happened a couple of days ago. Do you, do you think that like, can any of that stuff, like it can be seen as negligence, but is any of it you think like purposeful? Do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if the business is struggling and they like want to sell their stock and it pops and then they sell it and then, oh, wait, we messed up. Maybe yeah. like that's really bad. Yeah. I, I don't want to accuse anyone, but you, I mean, you have like the Enrons, like back day when they were like messing up with financial statements and not really looking at turning a blind eye could definitely be like intentional. And that's like fraudulent. You don't want that. That's super high risk. And it doesn't just impact you. It impacts a lot of people. Like if your financials are, are not, if you don't have a good, reliable and trustworthy like, team, then that can, that can mess up the entire business. Like you have to lay people off. You got to return money to investors and you got to pay debt off and then you don't have the cash to pay payroll. So there's a lot of complexities behind it. Yeah. Now you mentioned earlier, like the, it was really rigorous to earn your CPA license. Can you walk us through like, I guess the journey to earning that after you earned your, uh, your BS? Exactly. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, yeah. Undergrad, my undergrad was a concentration in accounting and uh, the CPA dude, like, wow. <laughs> like I didn't take it seriously at, the, at first. Yeah. So context of the CPA exam, it's changed over time. It always changes. So a little history on the CPA exam. So before my time, you had to sit for this exam that covers like four big sections, like law, tax, cost accounting and financial reporting. And so there's a mix of that, how they test it. Before you had to sit it basically in one, we had to sit for it like in one day. And it's literally like an eight hour, maybe 10 hour exam, or maybe you take it over two days. And this is when like, like my professor took it. Yeah. And they, they equivalent, and just so context, so you have something to compare it to, the bar exam for lawyers 
they still can't decide which is harder, the CPA or the bar exam. <laughs> what? No, no, no joke. Like some people I've talked to and I'm like, my law professor is like, my CPA exam was way harder than my bar exam. Like it was completely, it was so hard. Like it was crazy. And, and I've talked to other people too that's tried to pass a CPA exam and they passed the bar. And like, yeah, there's no way I was going to pass a CPA. Like it is impossible. And so it just just gives you perception of depth, like how crazy that exam is. So that so the CPA exam now, or when I when I take when I took it, it was composed of four parts, and you basically had three to four hours per part to take the exam, and you had to pass the exam within eighteen months. And mm-hmm. so if you did not pass all four exams within the eighteen months, you basically had to restart and take every single exam again. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. And I think they just extended it to like 30 months. To me, honestly, I, I love the challenge. Like 18 months, done. You want me to step up? I got you. All right. If this is the rigor it takes to be in this profession, I'm going to push myself for it. And so right after I graduated in college in, in, 20, in 2012, uh, I started studying for the CPA exam and I took the Becker CPA exam course. And so a lot of what happens a lot if you if you have an employer um, that wants you and you should pursue your CPA, it's a really good c- career move if you're in the accounting profession. But if you're if you tell a company, a future employer that you want to do that more often, they will actually either do one or two things. They will pay for your course so that you can it's expensive. It was like three or four grand at the time. And they'll pay for your exams, which can add up to quite a bit. And then they'll also um, that's like the one piece of it. The second part of it, and this is what a lot of big four companies do. If you pass your CPA exam within a certain period of time, you get this bonus. So, Hey, if you sign, if you, if you set, if you pass your CPA as a, as an associate at like a, a PWC, for example, and you pass them within the year, they'll give you like a 10 grand, five grand bonus or whatever it is at the time. And so that's an incentive. Okay. I got to pass this exam because the, the, they do know, like, once you get this under your belt, like you'll learn a lot faster. Number one. Well, let me take that back. You have the capacity to pass this rigor of exam, then you could definitely get into involved and push into other areas of accounting. And so there's there's definitely an incentive for to, the businesses to help you push to pass it. And so I started college or after I finished college, I started my my career. I went straight into the job. I think I took like two, three weeks off and then I went straight to the job. I need to start making money. I was like, man, I am broke. I just put my, my I best put I just proposed to my wife and so I put that ring on the card like I gotta pay that card off I gotta help pay this I gotta pay it, it was crazy so anyways I started working immediately and then I would basically study full time so I worked from like whatever I think they were starting at eight thirty nine thirty in the morning I'd be done at like six and then I would basically study for the rest of the evenings for this exam and so for about a year I had no social life like it was really hard well. Let me take back the first couple of months when I started, I, I, I was a little lenient. And that's when I told you earlier, I yeah. kind of didn't take it seriously. So the first, the first exam I took was called FAR, F-A-R, Financial Accounting and Reporting. I think that's what it stands for still. And so that is like, of all four exams, most people say that's the hardest exam to pass mm-hmm. of what I've heard. And so I'm like, I got this. <laughs> That's my love number is easy. So I took the, the, the thick book of Becker. It's like 20, it's like 20 chapters or 12, whatever it was. And I was just getting through it. I'm like, okay, I got through eight chapters of the 12 or the 20, whatever it was. I'm like, ah, oh, it's fine. I'll need to, I, I got this. So <laughs> exam day comes, I go into the exam and I kid you not, I, I didn't, I didn't even finish the exam. I couldn't finish it. I, there's like, there's, there's different tiers. Like they give you certain sections. I think it was three multiple choice questions. And then there's a simulation at the end. Mm -hmm. And so based on how you answer each simulation, the questions get harder or they, they do some testing too. And so they change the test as you, as you progress. Mm -hmm. Anyways, I got to the third one, (laughs) the third section. And I was like, okay, I literally have like 40 minutes left. I know I still have the simulation to do. I was just like clicking and guessing super fast. And I'm like, crap, I'm going to fail this thing because I have, no, I have no idea what these answers are. Like literally no idea. And then the simulation came. And this is why I'm like, you never, you always have to be, this is a really good learning experience in my life that told me you have to prepare for everything. So the Becker exam, the last chapter that I just kind of didn't look at, I'm like, nah, I'm never going to get tested on this. Like no one's going to test me on government accounting. It's impossible. 
Like government accounting is so boring. The guy will not, it will not see this on the exam. Yeah. Little did I know my simulation, all government accounting. And I'm like, this is the worst situation <laughs> ever. And so I tried and I, and then it timed out. I didn't actually finish the exam. And so I'm like this, wow. I walked out there feeling like I've been through like a tornado. I just felt the moral lies. Man. I just like this beat me up. And then you get your results um, for the CPA exam. Depending on the window you take it, it could be anywhere from three weeks to two months. And so I got my exam results about a month ago, a month after the exam, and I failed. I think I got like a 70, a 70 or like a 68 or something like that. And to pass an ex ex section, you need to get a minimum of 75 or greater. Well, you're right there. Yeah, I was right there, but I still felt destroyed, man. I was like, oh my <laughs> goodness, I cannot believe I went through that. And it was just... It was a good wake up call for like that exam. And so what ended up happening is, if I recall correctly, I started my job in like June of that summer. And then I failed like two, three months later of the CPA, the FAR exam. Yeah. And I said, there's no way in hell I'm going to fail the next one. I'm not going to fail anything going for it ever. Yeah. And so I would like, I just flipped the switch of like, no one's going to tell me I'm not going to do this. I'm going to solve for this. And so effectively, I kept my head down. I went through a lot of business seasons and business seasons, like a, like a really big term from like January to like April timing for preparing financials and doing all sorts of audits type of thing. That you work in like 70, 80 hour weeks. And so doing by doing full time and doing a business season, I studied like every night, like every night and every morning I'd wake up, I'd read the book, I'd answer the questions. And I'd retest myself, retest myself, retest myself, memorize things. And then I wouldn't stop until like I mastered those exam preps with Becker. Hmm. And then I had my exams. My next one was, I think it was, I think it was audit. Cause it was right after I finished like the audit season for the company. I took that one and then I, I, I aced it. I was like, awesome. Okay, cool. Okay. This is, this, this dedication is working. And so it took me about a year. Of the lot when I when I failed far to pass the rest of them, I specifically remember this. I didn't go home for Thanksgiving. I literally studied the entire week, and I because I had the exam like two weeks later for my last one. And I'm like, guys, I don't want to talk to you. I don't care about Thanksgiving. I'm thankful for you guys thinking about me, but I'm gonna pass this shit. So I was like, I need, to, I need to pass this. And so effectively, I sacrificed. I did a lot, not just the holidays, and uh, yeah. I got my exam result, my last one, like, I think the first or second week of December, I want to say, and, and I passed. And I got like a, what was I, what was I doing? I think it was FAR. Yeah, I think FAR was the last one I took, and I got like an 81 or something like that. And I'm like, cool, that's all you need. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going for a 99, I'm not going for a 100, I just want to pass. Yeah. And so I got I got like a, like a mid or some below 80s, and I'm like, okay, cool, I'm done. And so, and what was really scary about that, Will, I needed to pass the CPA exam, that last one, because there was legislation that was about to change the requirements in the next year. And so if I did not pass the CPA exam, effectively, I'd have to go back to school to get like a whole year's worth of credits to basically sit for the exam again. And so I was like, I was super determined. I got to go I got back to school spending another year worth of costs to do this. And so anyways, that, that was pretty tough. You really, you really have to commit to it though. Like it's really hard and, and, and not everyone can do it. I've seen people that have tried for years and they just can't, they couldn't get there. They could not pass it. So. I, yeah, I know, I knew a dude and he was like studying for it, but I'd never heard from him again. So <laughs> no, see, he never, that was like years ago. Now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah. He's, he's a pretty smart dude too, but I, he never mentioned it again to me. So yeah, I don't no, know. See, no, it's a really good, like if you, if you want to get into the accounting field, like uh, intra intermediate accounting is like the core of the of the concepts uh, when you're in college and it, principles accounting is like okay it's kind of intro but intermediate accounting is like that's the bread and butter if you get good scores on that then you honestly are going to be a solid accountant like that's something you could focus on uh, and then the cpa is like the next level like you can't prepare they, i think actually now college courses do have courses so you can prepare for your cpa exam along with grading the course the course credits yeah. However, uh, it's it's another thing actually doing the exam and studying for it. It's, it's crazy, and so I definitely recommend it if if something someone's passionate about the field and they want to stick strictly to accounting, 
uh, you can definitely do it and it gives you way more opportunity. I think you have a higher percentage of getting paid like 50% more than the average person because you have a CPA and you have a better trajectory of getting more leadership roles because you have a CPA. Yeah. And so that's really good for career development. You don't need it though to be in accounting. You could you can do the the more like regular accounting staff accountants that kind of just do the monthly close, reconcile basic accounts, things like that. You don't need to have your CPA license. So yeah. Love it. I'm loving the journey. That's gonna conclude the first part of our interview. We're gonna hop into the not so speed round. We're gonna ask you some speed questions and see what you have to say. Um, what are four words that describe an accounting professional? Oh man. Uh Oof. Four four words that describe an accounting professional. I would say meticulous. I would say this is I don't like it, but it's the word I think of, like introvert. <laughs> I don't I because I'm an extrovert naturally. Yeah. And I would say um methodical, like at least like you have to be pretty conceptually understanding to to think about the profession and like what you're doing. And then for me, I would say, and for me personally, I'd say uh, interactive, like the best accountants are like the ones you can partner with in your business. And so there's, there's a difference between someone that can just come in and do your books and cool, here are your numbers. Yeah. Okay, great. So what do I do with them? So the other, the, the other one's like a partner, like they're interactive and they're like, okay, this is how you had your income this month. You know, maybe you can actually improve your income if you did X, Y, Z. These are your cost of goods. Why are you spending so much on this area? If you can figure out a way to solve for this, because your, your costs are way high and you need, excuse me, you need to figure out to bring this cost down. And that helps the business owner or the company think a little bit differently about business because accounting at the end of the day, they see everything first before even finance does. So typically businesses have two departments, accounting and finance. And so the best accounts are interactive, they're engaged and they help kind of lead with the accounting and the finance side of the house. So I love that. Like, like a trusted advisor. Yeah, exactly. Like your lawyer, but on the number side, lawyers are the language readers of everything. Lawyers have to know how to read numbers too. When I had a good friend, she went to UC Berkeley, she was actually going to be a CPA. And she's like, no, I like law. So it's like, what? it's like, it's either CPA or law. And anyway, she, she had to know how to do options, uh, equity, things like that, uh, just by being on the lawyer side. So you get, you get a mix of it, but yes, definitely a trusted advisor, uh, that you can rely on for your business. Love it. Okay. What's a profession you would think being a CPA is most like another profession? Uh, like equivalent to being the CPA and accountant, I would say lawyers are pretty good one, like, because well, lawyers, uh, I don't want to be, I don't want to bash on lawyers because I actually want to be a lawyer too. Like, I actually really love my business law. I love to argue. Like, I love to have a good discussion. Okay. And I, even if I'm wrong, I will argue to the dick. My brother. <laughs> the sun is blue. No, it is not. Absolutely not. It is not blue. Take your glasses off the blind or something like that. I will argue to the tooth and nail. So, so I love to argue so, but I think the difference, like I, equivalent would be, I think would be lawyers, like uh, it depend on like the, the field, obviously, but that could be an equivalent to like a CPA person. Accountants do, uh, lawyers do read a lot more. They're in like the weeds of agreements, contracts, legal language. Uh, they're in with a lot of different uh, ways for businesses to grow and, and sign and, and grow the business for uh, for uh, like revenue. Like they have to sign revenue contracts to do to partnerships, things like that. That is a lot more intricate, I would say, on the upper operational side of the house. Yeah. But they're very meticulous as well. So that's why I thought law, a, a lawyer would be a pretty good comparable profession. Like someone who's got a CPA would would be equivalent to getting into that field. Yeah, yeah. I thought you were going to say uh, engineer, maybe. <laughs> so, uh, so engineers i would say i mean i love engineers like they're super smart uh my brother-in-law he's an engineer he's a genius he's like super smart he used to work at tesla he worked for a couple other companies like the guy is a magnet for it like solving problems on the engineer side but i think there's just a little quirkiness to like engineers versus accountants that just hits differently I could see that though. Like I could see the differences in, in the, in, or the similarities in engineering and accounting. So. Yeah. One of my good friends, he was, he's an excellent engineer. 
And I remember when we went to college together, he was like doing like doing like physics too. We'll be in the library like three, four in the morning. I'm like, bro, how are you like how are you doing that? He's like literally like a genius, literally. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. No, that's I, I had a classroom of mine, uh, uh Isaac, and and we had like this AutoCAD class. Like this was when I was in my engineering time. Yeah. And I hated AutoCAD. I hate it, dude. I hate it. I was like, I do not that's also a reason like I didn't want to do engineering because like I hated this program. I'm like, this is useless to me. And he's like, oh, you could do this. You could do that. I'm like, this is terrible. I do not want to be a part of this. So I actually failed that class because I stopped going to it. Because I was <laughs> just that disengaged. Like, you're, you're just like, wow, CPA failed the class. It's like, no, I hated that class. Yeah. And then I, my wife actually looked at my transcript. I was looking at it like a month ago. She's like, wow, I didn't know you failed the class. It's like, those are the dark days. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so... Very similar, but just a different type of lens of how they enjoy like doing something. And AutoCAD was not for me. Balance sheet, P and L, cash flow, you know, things like that really find are fascinating for me. So yeah. Thank you. What what does the world look like without say CPAs? Oof, uh, without CPAs, um, you'd have really crappy books and like untrusted like and companies to invest in. Like think about what's a, what's a big company like Tesla, for example, Tesla's very big, like they're massive, like they're a 500 cap, 500 billion cap organization, uh, Amazon trillion plus cap, Microsoft, I think it just hit $3 million, uh, $3 trillion cap. And cap, I mean like valuation of, of a company. And so they are run by big accounting teams. And I'm pretty sure they have a chief accounting officer who is a licensed CPA. And they, in order for you to go public, you have to have a lot of different compliance and requirements to be met. Those companies would not be as successful and would be trustworthy to the to the to the public or the average investor if they did not have CPAs. Because I mean your numbers have to be reliable, absolutely. And that's why you have audits. And that's why people always have reviews, quarterly reviews, because you you can say one thing or numbers and then how can I trust it? Like how can a bank rely on it besides your work? And so that's where the CPAs, that's where the audit opinions come in. That now, as a as a public person, me, I pick different stocks to invest in. Uh, I'll invest in them because I've reviewed the the financial statements. The, the first thing I look at is like, okay, is the audit clean? Is it a clean audit opinion? Okay, cool. Numbers look nice. I can at least rely on them. And then now it's like the operation I'm looking at. Do they make money? That's a separate aspect of it. But that's the first thing I look at. Is the audit opinion clean? Can I trust these numbers? And if there's issues, you got to figure out why. But yeah, that's how the world would look like if there was no CPAs. Because the Calvins are good, but they're not, I don't think they're as meticulous or as, and maybe I'm speaking with terms. Uh, I know a lot of the Calvins, but not them with the CPA license that are as meticulous, I would say. So, so yeah. Okay, I like it. What's the good, the bad, and the ugly about being a CPA? Oof, man. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, where do I start? Do I get the bad news first? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the bad news first. So, it depends on the profession. Like, if you really like the field, uh, you're going to enjoy like the reconciliations, making sure the cash is right, making sure your revenue is right, your accounts receivable. Like every word I just said, there is so much more depth to each of those sections. Like cash reconciliations, what is that? AR re accounts receivable, what is that? There's so much more depth to that. Like if I was to break it down to you over like, oh, that's why it's important. Holy crap. I got to make sure I collect my bills. I got to collect, I collect my invoices, things like that. So there's a lot more breadth of that. And so if, if you really like the field, you enjoy it. The, 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 the bad part about it is two things in the current market is that there's a shortage in accountants uh, in the market. There's not enough accountants coming into the industry. That's like the number one problem right now. Um, and then number two, the hours are long. And so depending on where you start and where you where you are in the field because you can come in in many ways hours could be very long and so what i mean by that is it's not your typical eight to five job in my opinion if you want to be a great cpa and a great accountant uh, you're in the details you're in the weeds you're working more than that for sure if you're in public accounting if you want to get into a big four like deloitte kpmg uh ey or P uh, pwc like those big ones yeah. you're you're expected to put in that time because you have to learn everything really fast and there is a ton of work to do and so the hours may not be beneficial for someone that wants a balance like a lifestyle at the very beginning of a career you have to basically put in your time which i think most professions have that 
yeah. accounting, I think more so we're, we, we definitely have a shortage compared to other industries in the current market. And so it is, it is a time balance. Like the, you, you really got to learn fast or else you're going to, you know, you, you may want like a stable job. Accounting is very stable. That's a positive, but yeah. if you really want to grow the career, um, I want to say you have more opportunities if you put in the time and learn uh, and get through those hours, like the big fours and things like that. So, so that's a downturn in my experience. Okay. The other, the other couple other uh, positive notes in, in things I, I enjoy is like exposure. Um, exposure, what I mean by that is if you come into the accounting field, you might see one, you, you see the books, right? But you see everything. Like I've, in my experience, I've got to learn so much how a business runs. Like I, if I wanted to quit my job right now, I could quit my job and start a business because I know exactly what I would need to do to make revenue, to know what gross margins needs to be, to know what I would actually need to make a profit. Like I could project something to basically pitch to say, this is how I would make money. And this is basically just on my background because how I know how to put books and no numbers. And so you get a really good depth of how a business works and how they spend money. And so when you have that experience from an accounting lens, if you if you do it right, like if you actually learn it and just just don't just like, oh, I gotta pay this bill, like that's you gotta be learning and absorbing it. And that is where you could take that skill set and apply it to your everyday life, manage your budget. Okay, I have an actual I have a budget, how do I manage my personal finances? Okay, yeah. now I need to know how to invest. Okay, if if the company is making a certain amount of investments, then I know how to invest in companies. And that's how at least I have seen it um, because you know how a business works. So that's a really big positive thing I would say about it from the profession as a whole, what you can take from it if you decide to do so. Okay. And the other one is, and this one is a really good one that I think maybe the average person would really enjoy is, um, is uh, job stability and re reliability. So because, and this is, I think my experience in, through time, like everyone always needs an accountant and yeah. everyone really needs a great accountant. Yeah. And so job stability is always there, especially with the market shortage right now. Like it's really hard to fill in those roles, like a staff accountant, senior accountant, because there's not too many of them and you're just kind of fighting for them. The recent grad trends are trending down, like people graduating with a degree, it's going down. And there could be a couple of reasons for that. I don't know why I could speculate. Maybe the people think the exam's not worth doing. And uh, for me, I think that's like, man, that's a bummer. Like if you get your exam done, like pat your back, you've been through it. And now, you know, they're trying to figure out things to change the license. So there's a lot of components that's causing it, but it's definitely stability. Like there is a stability in, in the profession. It's not like marketing, you know, with the current market right now, if you've seen kind of startups environment, and especially on, on online, a lot of companies, what they do is they'll cut uh, employees, they'll do layoffs. Marketing is the first one hit. Then yeah. hit, then it hit product, the production. Then hit other engineers get cut because okay, we need to. But accounting, you got to keep your books clean and you got to keep your books open. The business things like that, and so accountants like are very job security from that lens. And so, I'm not saying you won't get laid off. Maybe <laughs> maybe your maybe your accounting team is twenty people. I'm like okay, uh, you guys have to work more. They cut ten, and you guys have to take everyone. I'm like crap. Okay. But for that lens, there's a lot more stability versus like another profession. So those are really, that's a really positive one uh, from someone who's like a risk averse and doesn't really want to get into a field that may get impacted, like recruiters. Recruiters yeah. get cut quite quickly, right? They're like, oh, we don't need a recruiter, which I think is bad actually. But those guys get cut, marketing, things like that. You don't have to deal with that as much as an accountant in, in the profession. So. Yeah, you're right. Marketing is always the first get cut. Always. Uh -huh. <laughs> you cut marketing and they're like, how are you going to grow the business? Uh, we're going to market. Where's your marketing team? Oh, we just let them go. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's crazy. It's iffy. <laughs> are, are CPAs underpaid or overpaid? CPAs are paid very well, in my opinion. I think so. So yeah. it, and that's why I said, like, if you give a CPA license, you are tending to pay more. And so when I, when I got out of college, my salary was like, I think I, I think I kept almost every all my job offers, even the job offers I didn't take. I was kept to kind of track and see, okay, where I got more. It's kind of a cool stat. <laughs> Not everyone probably does that because they don't have like an account of mine like me. But um, <laughs> my first job offer was like forty four k, forty four and some change. That was in two thousand twelve. So adjusted for inflation, that's probably not too much now. 
But once I got my license, I got like a 50% bump. I think I was making like, after two years, I was making like 75K after my first job. I was like, all right, two, two, two years, two and a half years, that's awesome. Like, that's a really good return and really good bump. I got my license, I got my belt, my skills, and I did my time. And like, cool, now you can manage. You got your license, that's part of the deal. Now you can get promoted, and then you got your license. So I was like, awesome. So that was what I was making. That was my initial uh, progression right out of college. And so generally, that, that's probably higher now. Like if you if you leave college and you're probably making 60, 65 potentially coming in. And if you want your license, you'll probably be you know up in the 80s. Once you get experience, you're easily making 100 grand. So. Yeah, that's great. That's good. That's great. Uh, that's great. It's way over the, uh, the uh, median, the average. Um, two more questions for you, Christopher. What's one person, book, or event that changed the trajectory of your life for the positive? Oh, man. One person changed. I mean, I have a couple, but I didn't want to keep you here too long. Uh, <laughs> one of them, uh, more on a personal note, this was actually really big big for me. It was my, was it my sophomore year. I think it was my sophomore year. Yeah, I think it was my sophomore year. So I, I mean, I don't come from a wealthy background. Like... Grew up in a very rural area. I didn't have much money, and my parents didn't pay for any of my college. Like I worked full time, did school full time. Like anything you name it, any job I've, you you name it, I've done. Like janitor, brown work, you know, chemical. I've done everything you can name. I've done it. Like honestly, it's like how I got to where I'm at. And so, uh, but before that, uh, I, oh, I during that time, I actually my sophomore year in college, I almost quit because I couldn't make up the difference. I couldn't I couldn't afford college. And I was like, I, I'm not, I had to pay 15 grand and the school is like, you need to pay this or you're going to have to, you know, we can't accept it for next year. And I was like this draw, man. I was like, I failed my family. I'm a first generation, you know, graduate from high school, I, let alone I'm trying to you know, change the career of my family and in my gen, my future generation, right. To make them have an opportunity that my parents came and gave me. So I was distraught. And then my administration person at the company or at, the, at this university, uh, by the miracle of God, someone someone blessed and say, "Hey, Chris, you know, I got some good news. Um, someone's going to donate to your to your education. Someone's going to put the bill for you for the fifteen k." Yeah, that was like I cried all day, just all day. I told my boss, "I'm not going to work. I'm crying all day." So I literally was like that for me was like, okay, I'm meant to be here. Like I'm meant to bust my ass off and improve myself that I'm greater than, you know, what I could do. Someone else believes in me. They don't even know me. They just knew someone that, or maybe they did. The person pitched them who this guy was. And so they basically vouched for me. And then that was like huge for me. Like after that, like I never worked so much in my life. Like I worked like a dog, man, like crazy. <laughs> And to this day, you can ask people in my community that went to college with me. It's like, yeah, Chris was always working. Like, I don't know what that guy was doing. We never slept. Midnight, 11 p.m. to 4, p 4 a.m., walking the desk at the dorm, studying for my exam, work grounds for two hours in the morning, start a test at like 9 a.m., start. It was crazy. Dude, it was, it was nonstop. It was insane. But that kind of just sparked me in like, I need to get things organized. I need to get things great. And, and, and that really launched me to like really appreciate like the opportunities that I had in front of me. So that was huge. Like that's number one. Yeah. And then uh, I think my dad is, is a big thing for me in general. Like he works very hard. And so whenever I think about impact in my life and something that really puts me in trajectory, like how hard someone can work, I, I think of him that's had a very lasting impact. I think more so now that I have two kids, yeah. Now I'm like, man, it's such an important aspect to have like a good role model. And my dad worked a ton. I got to hang out with him on the weekends and that was most of it growing up. But I think that gave a lot of value to me of like, okay, I can see why. <laughs> now, now I know why he had to work so much and, and understand it. So I think those are probably the two biggest things for me as far as the response of what maybe and had the biggest impact on my life. So I love it. I love both of those stories. And yeah, the dad thing. This is definitely big in African American African American community African American communities. A lot of like no parent house or I guess one parent households and like yeah. my friends like ninety percent of felons uh, are in single mother households. So the father is uh, is very exponential in the in the it's in huge the man. Yeah, we were. I was just reading some stuff about that and learning about parenting books and reading a, a book with my kids. And that's hard being a dad, dude. Like it's so hard. I just want to smack my kids all the time. 
<laughs> so sleep. It's like, okay, please don't do that. I came back to seven times. Please don't do that. And I'm like, my dad would hit me across the head. And like, I feel like I have a flat part back here because my dad hit me so much. <laughs> so, but in reality, it's like, it's just having that person there in that life. It's like uh, um, uh, someone that a boy can look to and say, okay, this is how it is to be a man or how to be a certain part, an aspect that a mother doesn't have the capacity to, let alone when you're a single mother, it's insane how much mothers have to do. Yeah. And if you have the dad, it makes it way easier and, and the chances of someone to be more successful. And it's, it's, especially in our demographic, like for sure, like having the father there, it's a huge impact. And so I'm very blessed that my dad was around and, and not, I would say not as present because he worked a ton, but at yeah. least he gave me that example of like, okay, this is what it takes, you know, to do certain things. And so I 100% agree with you on that. I'm the same way my dad was like, same as you. Like I would see him at night or like on the weekends, like yeah. he, was so much. he was a cop and he always worked overtime and like, but people always like, cause they like, well, you're so hard working. I'm like, I don't work as half hard as my dad works. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. exactly. It's my dad. It's like, he's the only reason why I'm here. Yeah. And my, my mom, I'm not discrediting my mom either. Like my mom raised, I'm a family of eight. So there's five girls and there's three boys. So my mom raised all of us. Right. So my mom had her hands full for sure. Why they had eight kids? I mean, that's her own problem. <laughs> you kind of put this own problem on yourself, to be honest. But anyways, my mom was taking care of us at home and making things reliant and, and getting by. My dad obviously was the breadwinner. And so when we spent time with him, we appreciated that much more, I think, in general, because he was never around. And he wasn't when he was around, he's just tired, right? He's just working a ton. I'd go to work with him sometimes. Uh, he worked in, in LA and I helped him. He was a body man, so he would fix cars up and he would basically, if cars get crashed or whatever, he'd fix them up and some stuff, I don't even know how he fix. He just figure it out. I'm like, this guy's a problem. This, I want to be like this guy, just solving things. And so I got to that exposure. It's huge, man. It, it pushes us. And I, it's glad that we share the similarities there. So that's awesome. Yeah, the tired the tire part, it, it, it made a memory came in my mind. Like he would get home like at 11 o'clock me and my brother, like my middle brother, were like the near the same age, and we were like read his bedtime story, and he would always fall asleep like 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 like, like two sentences in. He was like, "Why? Why are you stop talking?" He'd be looking on the ground, he'd be on the ground sleep. <laughs> yeah. uh, I've done that a long time, but it's that's yeah, funny. Crazy, man. No, man, it, it definitely is a big driver, and uh, I appreciate that because yeah, and, and it gives me more motivation to be you know, hardworking and, and show my kids uh, yeah. what it means to be a hard worker and. It's hard now in our current climate. Like, what does that even look like? Like our current, uh, like, I don't even know, like the next generation, this generation. I want to make sure my kids know what it means to work. I have no idea how some things I see in memes and like people are like, like lazy. I'm like, what do you mean lazy? Like, come on, you got to get to work. Let's go. And so it's a crazy environment right now. So I got to, I got to lead by example. So. Yeah, it's this. Yeah, this new generation is. But I always try to like, like self reflecting Like, was I like that? But I don't think I was. I, I think I was I, like I really wasn't. I worked like I've been working like full time since I've been like fourteen. So I can't really relate yeah. to this. But it's like this new generation is like they. I don't. I wouldn't call them lazy, but they're like they're lazy. I'm <laughs> lazy for you. They're lazy. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, they're they're. Uh, it's just different. There is a saying, I saw this speech somewhere and this guy is like, I forget that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna butcher the saying, but he's like, tough men, tough times create tough men, tough men create tough men, tough, tough, uh, easy times, easy times yeah. create weak men. And I, and honestly, I think that kind of is what's happening. Like we have a week, we have, we don't have as much tough times. I think we're gonna get there where people have to be like, oh shit, I gotta figure things out. I gotta get things together because complaining about it's not gonna work. And so I think there's a there's a cycle of the life cycle of you know how how people progress in life, but man, I'm not lazy, man. They're, this generation. If you think about it though, like like your parent and my and my parents, like like they grew up through like depressions and recessions, so like right. we knew like hard times. These young kids, like they they went through like the 08 recession, maybe. Yep. But like it, it's been like a boom, like you know what I mean? We're like we're in a weird place right now, but it's like. The consumers aren't really feeling it right now, at least. So it's like, it's, it's interesting. Like yeah, like you compare like World War II, you had the Vietnam War, you have the Cuban Missile Crisis, you had all this crazy stuff. Uh, you know, the, our, most generation now, it's like, okay, the real estate uh, issue, but they didn't, they weren't old enough to even buy. So how could you even, you know, be part of that? You have the tech bubble potentially, uh, you have COVID, that's like the most crazy thing that's happened, I think. 
Yeah. And then uh, what else is, I mean, who knows what's going to happen in the next two, you know, global outage. I don't know what's going to happen. So crazy. Something yeah. crazy. But so, last, last question before we hop off. Um, Let's say a young, young man, young, young lady watched the interview and they want to know how to become an accountant or a CPA. What are the steps that you give them or some just general advice to help them on their journey? Yeah, I would say, before you commit to like, I'd say this in any, any profession in general, like do research on the company, like the profession and just make sure it entices you. Like don't like college is very expensive nowadays. It's very expensive, like very expensive compared to when I was. And so I would say do research on the profession, do some free online courses. Uh, what is accounting? Like accounting, intermediate accounting, like Khan Academy probably has some accounting basic courses. I've actually been thinking about starting my own, my own accounting course to, to sell online because I love it so much. And that yeah. could be potentially another revenue stream. Uh, but I think they should basically look into it more versus like doing what I did in like sign up for four years and kind of figure out different professions. It, it'll help you kind of focus if you really like this or not. Maybe just go to community college, take the basic courses. And then if you really, really like it, then decide, okay, I'm going to get my four-year degree and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on that. And if you really, really want to be successful and be really good at your accounting profession, like specialize in accounting, I recommend getting your CPA. Like that's going to be game changer for someone who wants to be in the accounting field because it shows you the rigor that someone has to go through to get the license. And it opens up a lot of doors like management, um, director roles, things like that. It's, it, it, it lives you a lot of opportunity. And I think people see you in a different light, to be honest. Okay. It's like... You pat if you ever see if you if you graduate college, okay, cool. That's that's good for you. If you ever see yeah. CPA whoa, like, oh <laughs> you just walk through the door, like you, that guy, like give him like give him some space. So <laughs> kind of the vibe, like just in, not just me, but like in general, like people have their CPA license. There's a lot more respect for someone because they've gone through that process to get a license and very much similar to lawyers. Oh, you're a lawyer, okay, cool. Oh, it's been to the bar, the guy knows his stuff, it's respectful. So they gain that kind of authority, if you will, once they get the CPA license. So yeah, start, do some research with the company, maybe take a couple of courses. And if you really like it, go to community college, you know, do a couple of years to get your basics in. And then um, I think community colleges do allow you to get like the credits to get your CPA license. Um, and then I think you're, you have to have a certain amount of hours. You have to get like 20, 225 semester credits, I want to say. And so I don't think you have to go through a full undergrad program as long as you get your hours in like your credits, and then you have to have a certain amount of hours and experience to get a license. So, um, think about it first, do some research. If you're like it, you know, give me a call. I'll, I'll convince you to, to do that versus doing something else. I, I really, I'm passionate for the industry. I really enjoy it. And so if someone wants to do it, I definitely recommend diving into it. So definitely. Man, Christopher, this has been an amazing episode, man. We really appreciate your time. Let, if you, any last words, like if you have a if you have like I know you say you might sell it, you might make it a counter course, and we will definitely promote it if you make one. Or... <laughs> <laughs> if you have, yeah, any last words. I would say uh, my last words is uh, if you if you if you if you're watching this and if you're really into accounting, uh, I mean we're short as like there for, that's the ones to entice you. Like you should, in general, like look at a market that's in the need, boom, come make a difference in our field. And it's adapting, like you have different cryptocurrencies. We didn't get into that, but that's a whole different level of accounting and what that means and for the future. There's a lot of opportunity in accounting if you get into the weeds a bit. For whatever reason, people don't think it's exciting because it's word attaches accounting. Maybe I'll change the name something to like detective or something. But accounting, in my mind, it's really interesting and it's it's evolving. And so there's a lot of opportunity for someone to come in and take advantage of the shortage and, and make some good money, but learn quite a bit and improve their life. So I definitely encourage it. I love it. Thank you again, Chris. Thank you, everyone that's still tuned in. Please comment, like, and subscribe. Y'all have a nice evening.